Chicago. Um, uh, we are lucky enough to be here because we uh, just finished, and I mean like 10 minutes ago, writing a book for O'Reilly called Designing Data Visualization. And we're going to talk about that sort of following the same thread for this uh, task as the book follows. But um, we've got some different examples mixed in, and uh, obviously the book goes into more detail than the webcast. But it's exciting and should be useful at whatever level of uh, stuff we get to and people get to see it at. So, um, I, should I just dive in, I suppose? Um, people, uh, people have an intuitive sense of, of, of visualizations and they like them and they're fun, but um, there's, some, there's some good practical support for it um, that we don't uh, necessarily talk about all the time. There's the book. Um, <clears throat> uh, part of the reason that uh, visualizations are so excellent is we have incredible bandwidth into the brain. Um, the biggest, biggest pipeline into our brain is through the eyes, and we have really excellent pattern matching software built into the brain, really excellent uh, recognition, and um, capabilities for spotting things like trends and outliers and all these other um, useful capabilities. So uh, visualizations have the, the uh, ability to get a lot of data uh, in front of someone and, and allow them to sort of see the shape of it very quickly. Julie's going to talk a little bit more about that. So uh, one of the interesting things that um, visualization can help us do is to differentiate between uh, sets of numbers that may look similar statistically. Many of you will be familiar with um, this data set, which is Anscombe's Quartet, uh, developed by a statistician. Uh, and basically what it is is four sets of data that look identical when you analyze them statistically, but are actually very different once you plot them on a graph. You can see um, that blue diagonal line there is the statistical um, rendering of the data when you just crunch the numbers. But then you can see the actual individual data points, um, and their various regression lines uh, would look very different. So um, this is part of the reason data visualization is so important, is it helps us not only explain our data to other people, but also explore it for ourselves. And that's one of the key distinctions that we want to make, is this concept of exploring and explaining. Um, and this webcast, as well as our book, actually will focus more on the explaining part. But essentially, exploring visualizations are useful for when you, you don't know exactly what the shape of your data is and you want to look and find out what it has to tell you. Explaining data visualizations are better once you know what that story is and you're trying to tell it to other people. Uh, so just another quick uh, example of that for each one. Exploratory visualizations are like this one uh, from Juice Analytics. Um, this is actually sort of a hybrid visualization because the data set has already been curated a bit, but it's presented to the user in a way that lets them change the parameters uh, to interact with the data and explore it to find out what's inside of it. Uh, whereas an explanatory visualization is more like this one uh, taken from Tableau's public gallery, uh, which already has selected and rendered the data for your your viewing pleasure. Um, and it's pretty much, it may still be interactive, uh, but it's pretty much already selected uh, and is useful for explaining. No? So. Oh. Go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry, I'll go ahead and take this part. Um, so the, the three inputs that you're considering when you're generating a visualization are uh, the three shown here, yourself and your own goals, what you bring to the table as a designer, uh, your reader and their needs, um, and the data and what it's telling you and the story that's there for you to tell. And uh, corresponding to those three inputs are three process steps that you'll need to engage in. So. So the way the process goes is first you have to decide what it is that you're designing based on your own goals, the needs of your reader, and what the data has. And um, typically what happens is there's some subset of the data that is, is appropriate to tell your story. So that's the first thing is choosing the data to include. That's the first piece. Um, once you've got the data, uh, defining axes, you're basically 
scoping your problem. You're basically saying this is the this is the most important relationship, this is the most important domain that I need to represent. Um, and then finally, you get to encode your data, put it on the screen, pick colors, pick shapes, label it, make connections, that kind of thing. Uh, and this is that's the, the very short version of the process. And so um, there's more obviously in the book about all these, and we're going to talk a little bit about each of these steps going forward here. So. Uh, the first step, why are you here? What is your goal? This is a um, uh, frighteningly overlooked step of the process a lot of the time. Um, people say, well, we're here. We're going to show the data. Um, and uh, showing the data is good, uh, but, but, the, but the goal is when they're stated at this sort of vague level, like show the sales figures, show the data, let's see what we have. Um, if you're just doing it for exploration reasons, that's fine. If you don't know what you have and you want to go see what trends you can find. But if you actually want to get something actionable, you have the data, you know it's there, you want to get answers out of it, you want to be able to make a statement about what's available. So uh, show the sales figures, eh, eh, that's not a very good goal. It doesn't give you a lot of guidance. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't help you succeed, and it certainly doesn't tell you when you achieve something useful. What you want is something more like show which product lines are performing best and worst in each region for each of the last five quarters. So this is useful at a wide variety of levels because it tells you what sort of data you need to include. It tells you what sort of relationships you want to represent in the data. It gives you a target so that you know when you're done, when you've achieved this statement. You can actually say, yes, we are showing that specific thing. We know we have created the right solution in this problem. Um, so that's a, a pretty important thing is stating, uh, stating the goals. Uh, mind you, what we have here is that it doesn't have any reference to encoding. This hasn't said use a scatter plot. It doesn't say use a bar graph or a timeline. We're not at the point yet where we're talking about implementation. We're still talking about what result it is we want to achieve. Once you've really figured out what it is you want to achieve, then you can go and figure out what the best um, implementation is going to be, what the best shape is going to be, what axes, whatever, all that. You don't want to talk about that until you've really figured out what your goals are first. So if the first thing you say is, we're going to use a scatter plot, we're going to use a timeline, uh, you're doing it wrong because you've now, um, rather than letting yourself think outside the box, you've now built yourself a nice little box to think in. You, you are not allowing any creativity or any alternatives that may be superior solutions um, come into the conversation if you start the conversation by saying, here's how we're going to finish this. So the next um, kind of leg of that tool that you need to consider is your reader in their context. So again, to state something that may seem a little bit obvious but is often overlooked, your reader is someone other than you. They're someone different from you. And that means that they bring different ideas and different knowledge and different assumptions to the table. And you'll want to consider those when you're designing your visualization because part of the reason a visualization is such a valuable communication method is that it's efficient. Um, your brain can intake a lot of data through, you know, your visual cortex very quickly. Um, and it does that because a lot of those interpretations, those encodings are automatic uh, or so, so fast, so ingrained that they may as well be automatic. And so you want to take, um, take advantage of that and not fight against it. But that means that you need to work with those assumptions and uh, conventions that your readers are used to. So um, you're probably going to be designing for a variety of readers. Not all of them are going to bring the same knowledge and conventions to the table, and that's a challenge. But you'll want to focus on your most important sort of core audience group and their context and design to that. And then other sort of concentric circles of readership outside of that will, um, will adjust for you. But the kind of context you'll want to consider are these questions here, motivation, level of interest. What, what kind of details do they need? What sort of level of information do they need to make the decisions they're going to make based on your visualization? And what kind of time frame are they working in? How fast do they need to be able to make a decision? Um, the faster they need to decide something, the more you're going to want to pair things down to their essence and make them simple, make them understandable. So all of these kinds of parameters will affect your design decisions. Um, 
in addition to this, the context of their usage, there's all these questions of identity uh, that your reader is going to bring with them. And these are things like language considerations, including technical jargon they may already know. Um, you'll want to consider terms that you need to explain um, or that they'll already know. There's also quite a lot around national and religious identity when it comes to, uh, especially to colors and connotations around colors. Um, you'd be amazed when you stop to think about it how many associations we have with different colors and combinations of colors, um, but also with different shapes. Um, you know, you think about a crescent or a star and the various connotations that such a simple shape can take on. Um, this combines with political perspective and other kinds of biases. So you want to have these all in mind um, when you when you design. The next big consideration is uh, actually looking at your data, and this is going to sound um, a whole lot like you're putting together um, database tables. So you want to know looking at your data. How many different dimensions does it have? Um, if you have a time scale, if you have a quantity. One example we use in the book is uh, stock graph. So with the, the price of one stock, for example, you have a price and a date. And, uh, and then if you add multiple companies, now you've got a company. So that's three dimensions of data. And sort of the more different dimensions of data you have, the more challenging it can become to visualize them. So understanding what your different data dimensions are is super important. The other thing that is particularly important to get the encoding right is you want to know what those sorts of uh, what, what 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 the shape of those different data dimensions are. So the encoding of company in the stock graph is categorical. They're not ranked. I mean, you could sort them alphabetically or something like that, but that's not an inherently ranked thing. They're just uh, the name of the company. Um, there's ordered data, like the time series data is going to be ordered. There's going to be quantitative data, like the price as that moves up and down. Um, some of these are going to be continuous. Some of these are going to be discrete. And understanding how your data varies is going to allow you to pick the right encoding that varies in a similar way. So some of the visual encodings that we use um, vary in different ways. So uh, we'll harp on this a lot because it's a really important point. Color, for example, is not something that is quantifiable in a useful way um, in this culture. And I'm sure people are going to rant and rave about that. But um, whereas something like position or number or size um, you can actually quantify, and so you can order them in a useful way. Um, but again, understanding what is in my data, what is the shape of my data, what are my dimensions, and how variable are they, um, that's, the, that's the sort of thing you're going to want to know going into it so that when, you, when you've chosen which data to include, you can apply the appropriate encoding onto it. You'll also want to make sure that the uh, data that you're selecting is relevant. Um, that sounds obvious again, but part of this is an editing process. Part of this is making sure that the data you're including is there for a particular purpose. It's serving specifically the goals that you laid out for yourself at the beginning of this process. And it's also serving the decisions that your reader is trying to make. Um, sometimes you'll be tempted to include additional data because it's interesting or because it seems relevant, even though it's only really tangentially uh, related to, to your goals, resist the urge to include things just because they're cool uh, or interesting or different. Uh, really have the discipline to restrict your data to what's relevant to your goal because any extra data that's in there is only going to serve to distract or confuse the reader. Um, it's, it's noise and, and you really want to pare down the noise so you can have as much signal come through as possible. So uh, moving on from there, the next phase is encoding. And um, this was summed up so beautifully and so briefly by Marit Steffner that I have to quote him. Uh, when it comes to encoding, the biggest lessons are position is everything and color is difficult. And um, we're going to focus on these two uh, encodings. Um, because they are very prominent, they're very powerful, they're very useful, and um, can, be, can be done well and can be uh, very difficult. So um, position is, 
is sort of the, the universal encoding that you can encode any type of data with position. You can encode categorical data. You can encode order data. You can encode ranked data with position. And because of this, it becomes incredibly important um, to, to use it properly, to use it so that you can use it to its greatest effect. So we advise, and a lot of people advise, and this goes back uh, a couple of decades, that, that the, the best thing that you can do is understand what your most important data is, understand what your most important relationship is, and use position to encode that. So that means picking good axes, and something that um, we talk about in the book, and that you will see if you start looking at data visualizations or information visuals out in the world, is position is often underutilized. People will pick one axis but not two, or they'll have sort of a network graph and stuff's kind of all clumped together, but the left, right, or the up, down position uh, is not being used very effectively. They're, they're, those axes are not defined, and so there's information, um, the potential to convey information that, that, that is not happening, uh, that, that opportunity to convey knowledge is being wasted through this, this very powerful channel, this visual location. Um, so in this particular uh, graph example, um, they've done a couple of things. There's, there's good axes here in terms of the year on the horizontal axis and the market cap on the vertical axis, so that's a useful thing. But they're also using position uh, broadly to uh, clump, to encode these companies in terms of how fast they grew. Now they've got the color here to um, redundantly encode them, the, the three different groups. But they could just as easily have uh, put gray lines in there and labels and said, this group on the left is the, is the hot group, this group on the right is the, is the slow group, et cetera. So um, thinking about your axes, thinking about uh, the relative meaning of your axes. What are the cultural implications of things like left and right or top and bottom? Um, or important things are going to be on the left. Things that come uh, later in time tend to be on the right. Um, typically when we have a timeline, we have the old stuff at the very top of the page and the newest thing at the very bottom. Although if you talk to geologists, they'll say, no, 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 the old stuff's at the bottom and the new stuff's at the top. So there's audience considerations when you're picking axes. If you're dealing with uh, countries where the language does not proceed left to right, then how they are going to assume the timeline flows or how they're going to assume the importance flows with this axis is going to be different. So these are all considerations. But, but again, the fundamental um, concern when you're picking your axes is you want to be sure that you are picking axes that will best represent and best reveal the most important data dimension, the most important relationships that you have. Um, because if you get that wrong, you know, it's much, much more difficult to convey the knowledge that you really want to convey. Um, moving on to color. Color is difficult. Color is difficult. Um, as I alluded to earlier in, in terms of audience context, there are a lot of common color associations that are, are going to come in and trip you up if you're not aware of them. Um, here on the slide are a couple of common color combinations and the ideas that they can convey. Um, there are also lots of associations with individual colors, and those vary widely from culture to culture and country to country. Um, red is an especially fascinating color because uh, it has all different kinds of associations. It can signal warning or danger, like on a stop sign. Uh, red can signal uh, prosperity and good luck in a lot of places. Uh, it can signal happiness. It can also signal sort of anger and violence and war in other places. It's the color of blood. Um, so red has all these very sort of passionate meanings that can go one way or the other, and it's a, a little bit tricky to handle in visualizations for that reason. It's very bright and attention-getting. But it can easily skew in a direction you may not intend if there are other signals pushing it in one direction versus the other. Those signals might include shapes, they might include other colors next to it, um, et cetera. And those are the kinds of things you'll want to ask yourself and want to consider uh, when you're choosing colors in addition to simply aesthetic uh, considerations about does it look good. Uh, a good technique here is to Take, um, take a, a stab at a color palette and then show it to a friend uh, or a couple of friends and see if anything jumps out at them. A lot of times, just like when you're writing, you're, you're so close to your own work and your brain already knows what you intended, so it's hard to catch some of those associations that other people might have on your own. Uh, don't be shy to employ friends and family to help, um, help you identify some of those 
uh, unintended meanings that might might be there. Um, the other reason that color is difficult is that people tend to use it to imply order. You may see things uh, that are labeled, you know, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and that's supposed to, uh, you know, that's supposed to um, impart some kind of order. Color is not an ordered um, property. So people say, what about Roy G. Biv, the rainbow colors? That's, that's a cultural convention. That's not a natural ordering. Um, wavelength is a, sort of a natural ordering in physics, but again, our brains aren't necessarily hardwired to interpret uh, color in that order. So although there are strong cultural conventions in certain places, color should really be restricted to identifying cate different categories of data rather than implying order. Um, that's something that a lot of people get wrong. Um, and here's an example of what I mean. Here's a heat map uh, showing different altitudes um, in Europe. And you can see they've used red to indicate the highest altitude, purple to indicate the lowest, although there's, you know, there's a scale over um, on the left. That scale is actually a little bit misleading because they've got the red down at the bottom and the purple up at the top when really they want the red to indicate the highest point, so you'd think they'd put it highest on the page. Um, this is, it's all just very confusing. They would have been much better off using gradients of a single color um, or using some other method to, to indicate this range. So we're going to talk about uh, some things that people also often get wrong because it's fun to show the bad examples. Circular layouts, uh, pretty much always wrong. Um, this is something that you'll see very often uh, coming out of um, undergraduate graphic design courses when they have to show data. And they've never really done anything with data before, but they're used to doing really cool, sexy, round, curved images, layouts, whatever. And so they go, well, we'll just show our data circularly. Unfortunately, uh, this also comes into the professional world now and then. Um, these are two examples from very different places, but uh, the flaws are more or less the same. It's, it's, um, the problem with circular layouts is that our brains are pretty darn good at representing and comparing uh, linear distances, and our brains are pretty terrible um, at comparing things like arc length. Uh, if you have two of them right side by side, you know you can tell the difference between when the hands at the two o'clock or at three o'clock, but uh, when we're looking, for example, at these uh, pie wedges in the left of these two here, um, it's much more difficult to say, well, yes, the, the one that claims to be 12% is just about half as wide as the 21% that the smaller ones down there are smaller. Those, those estimations are particularly difficult to do uh, going around in a circle rather than linearly. We have a much better time doing those linearly. The other thing that often uh, gets done wrong uh, in this particular case um, is that by making, those, uh, by making that larger wedge taller also, they've added a whole other variable. They've increased the surface area uh, by quite a bit by making it a taller wedge. Um, and so actually hugely distorted the surface area relative to the amount that they want to show. Um, this would be uh, much better as uh, line graphs where you could just use the height or you could even do it with areas, which is a little bit less accurate but still not bad. But by, by bending them around in a circle like that and then also um, changing the height, and the height in this case doesn't actually mean anything, it just uh, is ordering them essentially. Um, it makes it basically impossible to get real knowledge from the size, and so you are forced to then spend your time looking at the little numbers, in which case a small table of data would have been much easier to get the numbers out of. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't look as cool, so you see a lot of this. With the graph on the right, um, the problem that you run into here with these circular layouts, because they're attempting to compare these wedge sections, is that anything on the outer rings, again, is disproportionately represented as being much larger. So if you look, for example, at um, those, the, the green uh, wedges in the upper left corner, you can see that if, if those are all meant to be the same width, because they all start and end uh, rotationally at the same place, um, that that innermost green ring is about half as long as the outermost green ring. Now, is it meant to be half as long, or is it meant to be the same length because it passes through the same amount of arc? Very difficult to tell. 
On the other hand, if you look down at the bottom in these purple wedges, you can see that they look about the same length, but it's very difficult to tell if they're meant to be equivalent because while they all start at the same place, they don't all stop at the same place. If they are, in fact, equivalent length, the one at the outer edge must be shorter because the circumference is larger when you get further out on the circle. Um, regardless of the intent, regardless of the implementation, it's very difficult to tell what's meant. It's very difficult to get accuracy out of this. Um, the only way to really resolve these well is you print digits on them so that people understand what the actual values are. And of course, if you've gotten to the point where you are printing digits, you're doing it wrong um, because then you, the visualization has lost all its efficacy. Uh, and, and there's no point in visualizing it if people have to resort to just looking at a table of numbers again. So um, these are some classic examples, but you'll see this everywhere. Uh, you'll see bar graphs that are sort of bent around in a circle. Um, very difficult to do that well, very difficult to do that right. There's a few cases where circular layout um, is appropriate, where you actually have things that are cyclical, like you want to show uh, frequency of birds passing your house at different hours of the day on a 24-hour clock. Well, that's a layout where because you have a 24-hour cycle it actually repeats, you can graph something around in a circle because it is repeating. If you want to deal with something like compass direction and you want to show the frequency of wind blowing from certain directions, that's fine because you're actually mapping a circular environment onto a circular graph and that makes sense. But when you're mapping these linear comparisons around in a circle, um, you're just completely distorting your accuracy and making it very difficult to get any kind of precision out of the image that you're creating. So uh, next big pitfall, three dimension. So this pitfall is related to the circular layout um, in, in this example because we've got a pie chart here that shows uh, apple versus orange juice consumption. And you can see in this pie chart that orange juice is the clear winner. When we go to the next slide um, and we add a third dimension, well, it's not quite so obvious anymore, is it? Um, the problem with 3D that you're observing here is that it adds additional surface area to the uh, visualization. So this is obviously a very extreme example where they've tilted the pie chart or the pie graph back so far that you've got this big leading edge here with all the red. Uh, but the effect can be observed in more uh, sort of moderate applications of this effect as well. If you start to pay attention to 3D pie graphs, you'll see that um, the leading edge adds enough surface area oftentimes to trick your eye in this same way into thinking that a smaller piece is actually larger than a larger piece simply because there's more color and more surface area being presented to you. Uh, you'll see this not just with pie graphs but with other kinds of visualizations as well that really sort of tilty effect and extra surface area um, is, is really misleading. Um, we should also stop and pause here just to go back and um, say a word about pie graphs in general. So let me do that now. Um, this, without the 3D effect, is actually a really decent pie graph, which is rare in and of itself and therefore worth noting. Um, and the reason it's a decent pie graph is because of the fact that it's only got two pieces. Um, the most common thing that pie graphs commit uh, is that they include too many pieces. There are too many tiny slivers, and your brain is just really bad at comparing irregular surface areas like this. And so one or two, three, maybe even four, our brains can handle and still get a sense of uh, what's going on. But once you pass four slices of a pie graph, your brain just kind of can't do the comparison to, uh, to any useful degree. And so what you end up doing is reading the numbers as if you were reading a table. You might as well be reading a table at that point. So sometimes you see these uh, pie graphs that have, you know, 20 or 30 pieces and it's just ridiculous. Um, so really try to keep it to four or fewer, which this one does very successfully. I wish it didn't have the little gaps between the orange and the red. It would be much nicer if it kept it as a, um, a continuous circle, but that's picking this at this point. Okay, so one more pitfall that we'll address is um, gradients. 
So this is an interesting um, demonstration of the fact that gradients trick your eye into seeing things recede or advance. Um, if I tell you to look at these two circles, which are colored identically with the same gradient except that one is flipped upside down, and I ask you which one is the bump and which one is the hole, most of us will agree that the one on the left is a bump and the one on the right is a hole. Um, and that's because the dark color causes the eye to see that as receding and the light color causes the eye to see that as advancing and your brain assumes that light sources come from the top unless otherwise indicated. Um, so because your brain assumes that the light that is protruding comes from the top, that's why we see the left one as the bump and the right one as a hole. If you were able to flip your computer screen upside down, they would switch. Um, so when you're applying gradients to areas in your visualization, you should be aware that they're going to trick the eye in this way, they're going to cause confusion. Most of the time gradients are there just to add some color or decoration. Um, they're entirely unnecessary and not useful to the visualization itself and they shouldn't be there. So there are some advanced examples of when gradients are useful or appropriate. Um, but in general, there is sort of varsity level pattern that you shouldn't you shouldn't get into unless you really have a very good reason for why you're applying it. Um, another example of gradients at work is here, if I can go to the next slide. Um, this is a, a little Windows toolbar and you'll see again, it's mostly decorative and it's kind of distracting. It doesn't really serve a purpose and in this case they've done a color gradient um, which again is, is adding a sort of dimension of encoding that doesn't seem to have a purpose. But the important thing to remember is that your brain is very good at looking for patterns and because of that, it expects patterns to mean something and it expects a disruption in a pattern to mean something. So when you see a pattern like color or gradient, something like that, your brain is going to expect a specific meaning and when you have established a pattern that you then disrupt, uh, you're also going to expect a meaning from that. So when it's purely decorative, you're causing confusion and you're causing um, is a sort of processing delay in information and that's not efficient or desirable. Um, so I think we're going to wrap up for now because we've got a great list of questions that we want to be able to get to. Um, thank you all for your attention and uh, yes, Nina, maybe you could uh, maybe you could feed us some questions. Hi there. All righty. Yes, we do indeed have many, many good questions and we'll just pick in the order that they came in from. Um, let's take a peek here. We, we'll start with um, Raja asks, what is leader in data visualization software? And then he says Tableau, question mark. Uh, Tableau is pretty good. Tableau is my favorite uh, general purpose tool for um, visual analysis. Uh, as with so many things in life, the answer to this is it depends. There are a lot of um, tools on the market that are very good for uh, specialized contexts. So if you're doing um, oil and gas exploration or uh, aerospace or um, finance or uh, some other sort of specific uh, context or you're in a specific industry, there are, there are definitely tools. Um, so for example, there's Palantir in the Bay Area um, does uh, some good work with visualization for government work and good work with visualization for finance and they have sort of specialized products for that. But in, um, in terms of general visualization, yeah, uh, I, like, I like Tableau as a desktop product. There's also um, a couple of really good software packages if you're willing to do a little bit of software development on your own um, that allow infinite flexibility. The leaders in that regard are, um, there's a language called processing, which is kind of a free form um, uh, visualization uh, toolkit that is uh, very common among people who are doing um, data art and sort of more exploratory stuff with the aesthetics of the data. Uh, there's a language called D3 which is based on JavaScript and has evolved from a sort of a long line of families of um, other visualization packages like uh, it's the same people who, who brought you Protoviz and who brought um, Flare and some of these other sort of uh, packages that people have been using for the last couple of years and it's a little more structured. Um, again, it's called D3. Um, 
it's a little more structured. Uh, it's, it's, it's made to just get you up and running very quickly in terms of being able to get visualizations on the screen and embedded in any web page. Um, and then there's a number of other resources, and there's, there's lots of uh, lists on the Internet and, and one uh, actually in our book, Designing Data Visualizations. Um, that book has a list of some of our favorite tools. Um, oh, and for statistical, the other, the other big one, for uh, statistical processing and some basic um, statistical graphs, there's a free open source language called R, um, which is a statistical data processing language that has some great um, plugins and visualization tools that people are really fond of. And um, uh, the New York Times uses that. Uh, Flowing Digity uses that. It's a really good uh, tool. Yeah, if you're, using, if you're using R, the, uh, the library that you want to look for is called ggplot2. Uh, that's a really powerful one and a great one to use. Perfect. Thank you both. And we have another question. It comes from Mina Morales. She asks, should one always use colorblind safe colors? Yes, when possible. Um, and there are some interesting tools out there on the web. Um, there's a great website that um, will help you choose uh, color palettes that are accessible to people with color blindness. It's a little bit tricky because what we think of as color blindness is actually um, there are seven or eight different kinds of uh, color vision deficiency. And the most common one is red green. There's also um, blue yellow, blue purple, different kinds of uh, color vision deficiency depending on what the what the physical underpinnings are. Um, so there's this website that will show you, uh, you can, assuming you're a, a typically visioned person, uh, you can go and select uh, which kind of color vision deficiency you'd like, to, you'd like to design for, and it will show you how the color palette will appear to someone with that kind of color vision deficiency, and it, it can also suggest colors. Um, I don't have the URL at the tip of my fingers, but I can, uh, I can find that and paste it into the chat, or I can, um, if you just Google for color blindness uh, palette picker, I think you should find it. All righty, another question comes from Martin. Martin asks, for 3D, is there an optimal XYZ angle to best showcase? Zero. <laughs> um, uh, I think the default is don't use 3D uh, at all if you can help it. If you really legitimately have data that really legitimately needs to be in a third dimension, um, it's tricky because what happens is you, if you have larger numbers in the foreground, you can actually occlude your data in the background, um, which is a problem. The other challenge is that when you have a 3D space, like sort of a 3D landscape, it's very hard to map from a point uh, back to the axis and get an actual value from it. So um, uh, I would say don't use it if you can possibly help it. Maybe encode that third dimension in another way if you can um, with intensity of uh, brightness, for example. Um, but I, uh, I don't know that I've ever seen a study or research on uh, what an optimal angle is. I guess I would say um, pick something where data in the background is not occluded by data in the foreground. I would just add there's another dimension to visualization that we haven't really discussed today, but that's time. Um, of course, when you add the dimension of time to your visualization, you're, you're essentially creating an animation. And there are all kinds of other considerations uh, when you begin to animate data in terms of, um, you know, if you've, um, if you've ever seen animated movies, you'll be familiar with concepts like shrinking and stretching and all these kinds of things that you can do to, to add visual cues when you're animating a visualization. Uh, that's a pretty complex topic that was outside of the scope of our time today, uh, but there's a lot more you can, you can research on that. Uh, so consider time as, as another dimension. But as Noah said, there's all kinds of um, other encodings available to you, color, brightness, luminosity, these things to, uh, to encode additional dimensions of data besides space. Okay, we have Anita. Anita says, great guidance on how to create informative visualizations that don't deceive, like your circles example. But I found that people like looking at circles more than lines and bars. How do you balance visual intrigue and appeal with data clarity? Uh, that's a tricky question. This goes back to the question of understanding who your audience is and what their needs are. Um, if they're a technician and their job is to take the data you're providing with them and go solve problems, 
uh, you don't have to worry about it being appealing. It's their job. They have to look at it. If you are generating stuff, um, generating visualizations that are going to be used uh, maybe in popular journalism where your audience is entirely voluntary and part of your job as the illustrator is to hook them so that they look at it, um, then yeah, you have to make it more visually appealing. Um, one, one mantra that I kind of like is um, you, you want to hopefully win. You want to hopefully be successful based on delivering insight, delivering clarity. And if you can deliver insight and clarity with your data, if you can reveal it very effectively, hopefully that's enough to intrigue people or to engage people. Um, if people are not engaged by the message in the data, uh, either they don't care or the data is being occluded in some way. So um, there's nothing wrong with making it aesthetic. Making it pretty and appealing is absolutely useful and viable, but if that's the only reason that people are spending time with it, um, either the data is not as interesting as you would like it to be or that they would like it to be, um, or it's hard for them to get something useful out of the data. So if you can go back to what you're designing, who you're designing it for, and what you're trying to help them achieve with it and really make sure that you're delivering value with the data and you're doing it in a clear and efficient way, then hopefully you don't have to rely quite so much on aesthetics to hold on. Do you have thoughts on that one? You said everything I wanted to say. I mean, I would just encapsulate it as don't decorate your data. Your data is important and interesting all on its own. It doesn't need the help of bells and whistles. And if it does, then you should probably go back to your goals and ask yourself why it's necessary to show that data in the first place. Great. And we have Susan. Susan asks, if you have any comments about interactivity and transitions and how that impacts understanding. Uh, that's a big topic. Um, we, we don't actually address it in uh, designing data visualizations. We do have a chapter on animation um, in our, our earlier book, Beautiful Visualization, which is a book of case studies. We have a, um, a chapter by Danielle Fisher on using animation effectively. Um, motion's hard. Motion's hard to get right. You can, you can definitely uh, you can use it to call attention to things. So if one of your little data elements on the screen is twitching, people will definitely notice that. Um, it's hard to track differences from screen to screen when there's a transition. So for example, instead of having one data set that morphs or evolves over time, another way to be successful with that is to um, show snapshots of it all at the same time. So, so you can look at the one minute and the five minute and the 10 minute and the 20 minute mark all at the same time and see how something's evolving. If you show an animation that changes, by the time you get to the end, it's very hard to remember accurately what things looked like at the beginning. Uh, so if, if that comparison from beginning to end is important, it's better to show beginning to end or show snapshots between beginning and end concurrently so people can really look at them side by side. Otherwise, um, they're going to sort of lose context. They're going to lose accuracy when you shift to the new view. Great. We have Tomoko um, would like to know if the presenters have any sources for comments that are about the brain, like the brain assumes light, comes from the top. If you have anything like that, you could share. Sure. Um, one of the books that we constantly pull down off of our shelf when we're trying to reference uh, visual perception is by Colin Ware. It's called Information Visualization, and um, the subtitle is Perception for Design. That's a great volume. It's really well written and it's compact. You can, of course, um, find volumes and volumes on uh, brain visual perception and brain functioning uh, neuro processing and all of that sort of things. Um, and there are various neuroscience journals you can read and all of that. But uh, Ware manages to distill a lot of this into a really um, accessible and fun read. So I highly recommend uh, that book, again, is Information visual Visualization, Perception for Design. Um, Noah, do you have other favorite resources? Uh, Colin Ware is the one. I mean, that's the, that's the book that everybody else cites as well. He's been He's been in the field for decades. He's a professor and a researcher. He's published uh, dozens, maybe hundreds of papers on, on visual perception, on the cognitive psychology of how we perceive things like relative uh, position and colors and all this. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of the standard. Uh, he has a newer book. So, so the book that, that Julie just mentioned, which I totally agree is the one to get, is about a 400-page textbook, and it's just awesome. 
full list of the information you want. I've seen this book is so powerful it has resolved arguments on the Internet. So that should be all we have to say. That's a, that's a um, pretty strong capability there. He has a newer book, um, a smaller paperback book that's uh, a much more concise. It's about half as long. Um, it's less expensive. I don't think it's quite as good as a reference, um, but uh, if, you're, if you're on a budget, um, you could get his, his newer book. But we're going we're gonna to definitely advise sticking with, with the full-on information visualization book. Um, it's, it's just the right one. Okay, it looks like we have a final question from Lakshmi, and this is related to one of the pie charts that you showed a little bit ago um, in the color orange. Um, orange appeared to represent the higher share. Isn't that correct? Why did the slide text end with a but? Oh, yes. Um, if I go back to this slide here, you can see this is actually a two-part visualization that we kind of cut into oh. to serve our purposes. Um, there it is. I hope you can see it there. So that part on the left is the first part, and that part on the right is the second part. And we kind of chopped it apart uh, so that we could present it to you in stages. But this is really a two-part visualization, and the but continues onto that, the top of the second page here. But first, let's take a look at this chart. So I hope that resolves any misunderstanding. Great. That's all the questions that came in. Um, did you, Julie, or Noah, have anything else you'd like to say to our audience before we wrap up? Oh, uh, I actually see a couple more questions in the queue, if you don't mind. Absolutely. So we have a question um, from Mina uh, asking about the Tableau graph and why they don't all start at zero. So let's just jump back there really quickly. Uh, I assume, so she says, why did they not all start at zero, zero? Um, I'm assuming that in this case, the distortion is uh, a little bit one of um, the source data in that they don't necessarily have records for each company back to the day that the company was founded, and so it looks like they're starting it uh, you know, somewhere around the first year maybe. Um, and then in terms of uh, vertically, by that first year, some of these companies are profitable and some are not, but they're not all starting um, from zero on the line. So that's my interpretation. And then the one other question that I saw here, uh, I think there's just one more, um, from Ricky asking, uh, what about patterns? Um, that's a really good question. Patterns, uh, I'm trying to think if we have an example in the deck here. I don't think we do. Patterns are useful for sure. Uh, they are um, similar to color in that they're really good for representing different categories. Um, Patterns can also be used to rank things in, uh, more effectively than color can. Um, and the way that that would work is if you have, for example, a basic um, hash mark or grid pattern um, that's not very dense, it has very thin hair lines, for example, and then you have another representation that's that same pattern, but the lines are either thicker or closer together, and so you end up with basically a, a, a darker, more effectively um, a blacker or a, a darker gray pattern that can actually represent relative ranking. And so you'll see back in the old days when people published things in newspapers in black and white, um, looking at something like an elevation map or a population density map or something like that, they would, those, those gray tones are actually, uh, because they only really had black and white, they didn't even have shades of gray in terms of being able to lay a less thickness of ink down. But the stippling pattern, the pattern of the dots used to print those was more or less dense. So the more dense the pattern of dots was, the darker it got, and so that red like a darker gray or a black, whereas a, a, a much paler uh, gray was achieved with a, a less dense pattern. So um, patterns are great. There's no uh, color blindness issues, obviously, if you're doing a monochrome pattern. Um, and if, if the shape of the pattern differs wildly, you get categorical encoding. And if you've got the same pattern with a different um, density or intensity, then you can do uh, rank uh, encoding. Not, not fantastic for doing real quantitative. People are going to have a hard time saying this one is twice as dark and therefore the number is twice as big that it represents. So I wouldn't try to use it that way. But you probably can get uh, a half a dozen, maybe maybe not quite that many, but you can probably get a half a dozen shades of gray or, or uh, densities of pattern using the same pattern. A half a dozen um, is probably about the limit that people can accurately differentiate from one another and say, yes, this one's darker than that one that's two counties over or two states over on the map or something like that. Uh, that was the last question that I saw in the queue, and I don't think we got any on Twitter that I saw. 
Oh, it looks like one just snuck into the group chat. I'll read it real quick while we still have you both on the line. Mina Morales would like to know, what is the best way to get started using processing or Tableau? Do you think they are useful for neuroscientists? I think they're useful for anyone, um, depending on what, you know, what kind of data you'd like to use and what, um, what kind of stuff you're trying to visualize. I know I mentioned a lot of disciplines have dedicated and specialty uh, tools and software available, so I'm not familiar off the top of my head with the state of the art in neuroscience visualization. Um, again, it, it depends on what kind of data you've got that you're trying to visualize. Uh, both Tableau, though, and processing are very useful and very easy uh, to learn. On processing, which was created by a, two gentlemen named Ben Fry and Casey Reyes. There are some excellent books. Um, there are two from O'Reilly. There is one from MIT Press. Um, by them, the creators of the language. Um, getting started with processing is a good, simple one to pick up. Um, and another one is called Visualizing Data. Uh, so those are good learning tools. There aren't any books yet, to my knowledge, on Tableau, but there's some good online documentation that you can take a look at. Um, and they also have a public gallery, so you can look through that and see if other people are using it to visualize the same kinds of data that you might want to uh, use it for. I, I will put in a word here. Um, Tableau as a product uh, is expensive. The desktop um, product is about $1,000. Maybe or maybe not in the budget of your lab, but if you're in the sciences, um, especially if you're doing anything statistical, uh, do check out R, which is a statistical language. It's got good graphing capability. A ton of people are using it. Um, there's really good support for it. Uh, there's tutorials and everything online. Um, you might have an easier time. I think they said googling for the R project or R language rather than just the letter R. Uh, Yasmin, I saw a couple more. It looks like the client is updated. There's a few more questions that we can. Um, sure, we still have a few minutes. So there's, there's uh, one related here that says, um, one from Martin Gomez, one from Jamur Rahman, um, both asking about color and ranking with color. One question is, not using Roy G. Biv, what about using gradients, especially for grayscale graphs? Uh, the other one says, I think intensity levels of the same color can order appropriately, what do you think? Um, thumbs up on both of those. That's more or less the same question, and the answer is absolutely. So if you want to use, uh, without varying, without changing from reds to blues to greens, but instead varying the intensity or the darkness of a color, either by um, uh, uh, changing the saturation from a pale blue to a, a bright blue, or changing the brightness from a very dark color to a, to a light color. Um, that's totally approved, and that actually does work really well. Um, tinting and shading are the technical terms for those if you're an artist or you know about graphic design, which is not my background. Uh, but, but yes, you can get... Um, you can get a variety uh, with those. And so you'll see, for example, that elevation map that we showed where it was this whole crazy rainbow going across Europe. A better version of this um, would have, for example, uh, a tan, very pale brown at the lowest elevation, and the, and the colors would get darker and darker um, as you go to the mountains, so you had a very dark brown at the top. And that's, that's changing the intensity along, um, along the saturation or along the brightness of the brown, but we're not going brown to green to yellow or something like that. So um, that is naturally ordered in the brain, that level of brightness or saturation that's ordered in the brain, and so you can do relative orderings with that. Um, again, like with uh, patterns, you probably get a half a dozen or so uh, variations that people can differentiate before the, the differences get too subtle, but you could definitely do an elevation map like this, for example. Um, uh, and, and that's a much better choice. Um, and so you'll see that on, on better elevation maps or better heat maps. Um, see. And there's one more question here. Uh, interesting to hear presenters' thoughts on available color resources such as Color Brewer. Uh, I like Color Brewer a lot, um, and the URL is colorbrewer2.com. I don't know how to type that in. Um, Desmond, if that was something you can display. Uh, but um, uh, colorbrewer2.com. Um, is uh, a site that will allow you to say, I need uh, a five color palette and they need to be completely different categories, or I need five colors and they need to be continuously stepped because I want to do an elevation map or something like that. And so you put in the requirements that you have for what palette and click the button, and voila, you get a beautiful little uh, color palette generated for you. It's a fantastic little tool. I'm super glad it's out there in the world. Um, 
and it's a, it's a great one for, for doing exactly this, things like maps um, or, or whatever your, your shading levels are. Um, scanning here, I think, I think that might actually be all the questions, although the tool is not updating them necessarily. As quickly. But like, do we have any more that you're aware of, either of you? I'm not seeing any additional questions, and I think um, we did get them all. Okay. The one last thing I'll say, um, just to clarify for people, so Designing Data Visualizations is the book that we just finished and sent off to the publisher, and that should be available in a couple of weeks, and that more or less follows the same arc of this talk with the same process-oriented conversation about here's the steps you take in order to implement a visualization well, and we get a lot more into detail about use of color and how to pick appropriate encodings and that sort of thing, conversations about your audience. Beautiful Visualization is a book that came out uh, a little over a year ago that Julie and I um, each wrote one chapter of, but we were also the editors of that book. And that book is 20 different case studies from all different, um, all different practitioners uh, visualizing all different kinds of data. So there's um, uh, scientific data, there's artistic data, um, there's some stuff that's very exploratory in terms of just looking at aesthetics, there's some that's very um, practical oriented, and it's a really interesting look at uh, a lot of different people's take on visualization and a lot of different ways of implementing visualization for a huge different variety of, of kinds of data and data sets. So um, there's, a, there's a few sort of smaller tutorials and how-tos in that book, but it's more just sort of a catalog and survey of things people are doing with visualization. And um, that was a really fun book to work on, and it's a really interesting read, and I'm going to read that book. And if you're super into this stuff, um, I will be speaking at Strata, uh, and there's some a lot of visualization-related content that's going to happen at Strata in New York City, in uh, starting in about uh, not quite two weeks from now.